Good morning, everybody. It is Wednesday, March 25th, and I have so many thoughts to share with you. This is going to be a long update. So continuing to work my way through this, I am now in the story of the Knight of the Cart or Lancelot. Before I get into some analysis or some things that I'm noticing in that particular story, I actually wanted to go back to Eric and Anid because there was another thing that I wanted to talk about in that one. One thing that I'm finding to be really interesting in that story and really in all of them is this sense of political instability. And of course, we are talking about a period of political instability, especially compared to, say, Roman Empire, right? And so, um, one of the scenes that happens with Eric and Anid is like, you know, Eric is basically traveling around and his wife is Anid is going with him and they basically just like run across all these knights as they're just like riding their horses on roads who apparently just like challenge them in the middle of nowhere. Um, and so it's like this sense of like almost the Wild West where it's like you don't know what kind of bandits you're going to have on this like if you go outside of like your safe sort of keep or your safe feudal system. And one, one is actually kind of comedic. I don't know if it's meant to be comedic, but there's a character. Um, gosh, what is his name? I have to edit this part out. But anyway, it's like this lord who has like a tall tower or whatever. And they're like, oh, we're just riding by this tall tower. And <laughs> this lord of this particular area sort of sees them out his window and he's like armor me up dude since he like gets in his armor really fast and goes down the tower and gets on his horse and it's like galloping madly after them and then they of, of course eric and this warrior sort of fight with each other but they're evenly matched so of course they become best buds and he's actually known as something the short i forget what his name is but he's like a short guy and i just thought that was hilarious but yeah it's like it's almost like this you know I don't know, Rapunzel Tower or something, and he's just like waiting for challengers to come by so he can like fight with them. So anyway, that speaking to this sense of like political instability and this like Wild West almost feeling, which I, I never really thought about in conjunction with the Middle Ages, because of course there's like this courtliness too. There's this sense of honor, there's sense of proper behavior and so forth. And so it's like the sort of political stability of the court is layered upon the essential po political instability of the nations because they're just not that like controlled they're they're all these little like feudal dominions that probably had a lot of conflict because it's like the the sort of federal power if you will the kingship itself was like not strong enough to like control all of these like little mini dominions that are happening in between okay so that's my point on political instability so the other thing that I want to talk about is the Knight of the Cart. So I'm now about maybe halfway through this story. I was hoping to finish it last night, but I got really sleepy. And then I honestly did not get that much reading done this morning, but I got a lot of thinking done this morning. So the story is called The Knight of the Cart, and you actually don't know the name of the knight. It's in, it says Lancelot in parentheses, so that's the only reason why I know it's Lancelot. And also that he's like trying to save Guinevere. And of course we know the story of Lancelot being in love with Guinevere and their sort of adulterous love. Um, but uh, throughout the story, he, he refuses to say his name. And the title, The Knight of the Cart, comes from the fact that at the very opening of this story, Lancelot sort of like rides his horse to death in pursuit of the knight who has captured Guinevere and is sort of like whisking her away. And so the next means of transportation that he has access to is this dwarf that is driving a prisoner cart. And so the dwarf is like, yeah, I can take you, but you have to get in the cart. And it's this point of like shame and embarrassment. You know, it's very dishonorable for this knight to not have his own horse, but to be a passenger in a cart and on top of that, a prison cart. Um, and so he's like made fun of throughout the book each time he comes up to a combatant. The combatant obviously misjudges him and says like, oh, you're the you're the knight of the cart, like, you must be an idiot, you must not be that powerful of a warrior. And of course, Lancelot comes in and is like, I'm super strong and you're gonna die. And that's uh, how all of the <laughs> engagements go. Along with this, there is this almost like Moses archetype because there's this, basically this um, situation where the kingdom that has whisked away Guinevere is also this political power that is oppressing this group of people from this region called Logris, which is where um, Lancelot is originally from. And so all of these 
people from Logris are basically, excuse me, in servitude to this king and are not allowed to leave. And so there's this alternative storyline or this additional sort of thread of storyline that's going on at the same time where it's like, oh, Lancelot is this predicted savior that's going to come and redeem all of the Logris people and that give them their freedom. So it's like this very much working within this sort of like Moses archetype of... Um, sorry, my computer, of, uh, uh, you know, this savior who's going to, like, redeem his people. And, of course, Moses is this prefigure of a Christ figure, like, that we also have in the New Testament, where Moses is bringing the Jews to the promised land of Israel, but Christ is bringing the Christians to the promised land of heaven. Parallel, if you will. And finally, like, once that clicked, then it made sense, like, why he is the knight of the cart. Like, why does he have to go, why is this plot element of him sitting in the, you know, having this shame put upon him so important to the story? Because it's, like, emphasized over and over again. And it's like, well, that's part of the archetype. That's part of the journey for that sort of redeemer character is that he has to go through a cycle of shame. So Moses used to be a prince of Egypt before he, like, fled and became this sort of shepherd in the middle of, like, Midian, like, out in the desert somewhere, this this recluse, almost. Likewise, Christ, if you think of him as, like, oh, he used to be in heaven at the right-hand side of God, and then he came down to earth and took on humanity. You know, obviously, that's a much more, much lower position than being, like, <laughs> right next to the king of the universe who created everything, right? So you, the, in that same way, you have this sort of, like, level of embarrassment or this level of, like, shame that is layered on top of the character. But it's only, like, positional shame because obviously the internal honor of Lancelot and of Christ are not really tainted. In Moses' case, it's a little bit different because he did actually, like, murder an Egyptian and he's, like, fleeing from his crime. <laughs> so, yeah, just very, very interesting. So there's also like this sense of like the impossible task. So the way that it gets revealed that Lancelot is going to be this savior redeemer is that he's able to like move this big like slab of this big slab of stone that's and it's like inscribed on it that only the person who does this is going to be the savior of the people of Logris from this kingdom. And so that's very similar to, you know, the sword that comes out of the stone that proves or sort of christens the king this sort of one impossible task if you will and then thirdly i wanted to talk about the sword bridge now this is going to take a while so the final task that really lancelot has to face on his journey is the crossing of the sword bridge and that brings him to the tower where this evil prince is that has um guinevere so it's like he's finally arrived with where guinevere is being held captive and one thing that i love about these medieval stories and folklore and mythology is how strange they are and like they do not feel like they have to explain themselves so literally this bridge is a sword it's a giant sword that's crossing this river and to get across it you have to walk across the blade of the of the brick of the of the sword which is the bridge right? And so it's like this really interesting image. And so what Lancelot chooses to do is he actually chooses to take off his gloves and his gauntlets and his um, shoes and his socks and everything in order to grip the sword better. But of course it cuts him into ribbons. And so he gets to the other side, but he's all like injured. And this is like such a good symbolic representation of the cost of doing what's right, right? There's always going to be a level of suffering that comes along with choosing to do what is right and what is noble, and that's like an unavoidable pain. And that's the, that's the cost of defeating evil. Like, defeating e evil in the universe is like a very powerful enemy, and it's going to cost you a lot to be able to defeat it going to suffer in that process. And the question is, is are you willing to pay the cost? Are you willing to even count the cost before you get started? And I wanted to talk about this because it's something that I find is really lacking in a lot of like YA fantasy fiction. And it particularly reminded me of, um, I didn't finish the series of books, but it's the one with the darkling and then the girl who has like the light power and there's like that big chasm of darkness with like evil demon creatures in it. And she's supposed to, like, have the power to basically be the counterpart to what the Darkling has done purposefully. And um, there's parts of that book that I thought were really good. 
So one of the things that I really like is this idea that she's sort of like re in the beginning re repressing her power and rejecting her sort of um, identity, rejecting her potential, and that actually makes her weaker. And so she's sort of like very thin and very weak and very sickly and pale and all of this until she begins to come into her power and sort of accept that as her potential and as her identity, then she becomes this like more radiant and more beautiful and healthy um, person, right? Um, and so I really like that idea. I also really enjoyed the scenes where she's like training with the old hag lady in the hut who turns out to be the mother of the Darkling and kind of like reveals his true identity to her. I thought that was really interesting as well. What I found really frustrating is the whole like and this is going to be spoilers, so if you don't want to know, I don't remember if this happens at the end of the first book or at the beginning of the second book. I think I only read the first two and then was like, eh, not into this. So the the task that's set before her is that she needs to go find this like magical white stag before the Darkling is able to, because there's like super, certain magical properties in his horns. So this is a classic medieval like quest trope. Um, and really the white stag in medieval art and literature represents like true love and it's always at the disappearing point in a painting. I don't think that's necessarily what it's being used to symbolize here, but that's okay. So she's like out in this like wintry, you know, tundra and she, they're like hunting, hunting, hunting for the stag and then she finally finds it and she's like, oh, I have to go kill it so that I can have, like, I can have this power that's going to make me powerful enough to really stand up to the darkling. And so of course she's like, she gets over to this stag and she's like stroking it and has these big brown eyes and she's like, oh no, I can't kill it, like I have to be merciful. So she doesn't kill it, but of course like the darkling is tracking them so pfft, you know, the stag dies anyway and she's like, how could you? Ah! And then of course like her hesitation causes him to have the opportunity to kill the stag in her place and then of course it's like he gets the power and then he puts the like stag horns around her neck and it becomes this sort of chain of bondage and then like later in the book it's like oh no but actually because you were merciful you actually got the power and so she's like able to break free and blah 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 and it's just so stupid and i hated it now here's the reason why I think it's stupid. And the reason why I think it's stupid is because for a good character to be strong they have to be able to count the cost. There's this tendency in YA fantasy, particularly I think YA fantasy where the lead character is a girl, where she has to be so compassionate and so kind that she is unwilling to count the cost. And she's unwilling to pay the cost of defeating evil in the land. So part of what like structurally allows a character to come into their power is their ability to uh, their ability to do what needs to be done. Their ability to cross the sword bridge. She is only able to cross the sword bridge for herself and make the sacrifices that are necessary in order to come into power. And so it's a cheap out to give her the power anyway when she didn't pay the cost. We see that like Twilight is a really great example of that, that as well, like in the end where it's like it's a non-war. How anticlimactic is that? It's like the author, <laughs> the author and the character are in this like collusion together where neither one of them are willing to pay the cost, but you can't have your cake and eat it too. And the reason why this falls so flat is because it's not true in real life. For anybody who's had to pass through difficult circumstances, you don't get to do that unscathed. You don't get to do that. Yes, you come through the other side stronger and hopefully healthier than you were before, but that doesn't mean that it didn't cost you something. It didn't cost you your innocence. That's why you're not a child anymore. That's part of becoming an adult. And that's what these stories are ultimately and truly about. So that's my rant for today and some of the thoughts that I've had. Let me know what you think about that.